Excitement tinged the air as crowds gathered on the hill overlooking the tennis courts. Whole families had come to watch the momentous game. Some had even packed picnic baskets and spread blankets on the grass. As the clock approached two, something electric went through the crowd, and as the eight players walked onto the court, everyone leaned forward in anticipation of what would happen next. Druid Hill Park in Baltimore, Maryland, is a prime example of a large urban park built in the late 19th and early 20th centuries to improve the lives of city dwellers. But like many urban parks, Druid Hill's history also includes racial segregation. For the first half of the 20th century, Druid Hill had separate designated areas for black and white visitors. In 1860, Mayor Thomas J. Swan dedicated Druid Hill Park to the whole people, but vast swaths of the park were closed to those with the wrong color skin. One of Druid Hill Park's most popular attractions was its tennis courts. The parks hosted several types of courts, both clay and concrete, but only the concrete tennis courts were available to black players. These black-only courts were in a constant state of disrepair. The better-kept clay courts were reserved for white players only. Anti-segregation protesters saw the tennis courts at Druid Hill Park as a rallying point. Through protests at Druid Hill and other parks across the city, community members attempted to change the official policy of the Board of Recreation and Parks. One of the many times that Druid Hill's tennis courts came to the attention of the board was the summer of 1948. A group of black and white young people decided to hold an interracial tennis match in protest of the park's segregation policy. The group included members of the Young Progressives, a subset of the political group the Progressive Citizens of America, and the Baltimore Tennis Club. The Baltimore Tennis Club was an all-black organization. The Young Progressives included many white and Jewish youth. Most of those involved were high school and college students. In the days before the game, the group put up posters advertising the protest to drum up support for their cause. The flyers instructed people to kill Jim Crow, demand your rights, organize to smash discrimination in recreational facilities. The text on the flyers also emphasized that there was no actual law segregating the parks. The park segregation was only a policy made by the board. Before the game, the young people reached out to city officials. They told the superintendent of parks that they would be playing the interracial game and asked for his support. He refused and told them that their request for permits to play on the tennis courts would be denied. To get around him, several of the white players applied for the court permits without indicating their intent to use them for interracial matches. On July 11, 1948, a crowd began to gather on the hill next to the Druid Hill Park tennis courts. Blankets were laid out on the grass and picnic baskets were opened. People were excited and upbeat and the scene had the air of a picnic gathering. At two o'clock, the two foursomes of black and white players, one group of men and one of women, stepped onto the courts in front of 500 spectators. The players were met on the courts by the superintendent of parks and the captain of park police. The two men ordered that the players leave the court, but they steadfastly refused. At that, the police began to make arrests. The male foursome sat and lay down on the ground, refusing to move, forcing the police to carry them from the courts. The spectators began jeering the police, yelling out, This is a free country! And read the Declaration of Independence! In a matter of minutes, 20 people were arrested, including all of the players and several spectators. Almost half were women, 13 were black, and two of them were under 16 years old. They were all taken to the Northern Police Station, where four additional men were arrested as they protested out front. A total of $800 bail was posted that day by the Progressive Citizens of America, the Baltimore Tennis Club, and other private citizens. Immediately, several groups issued statements condemning the actions of the board and the park police. Coverage of the trial remained in the news that fall and into the following year. The demonstrators were accused of unlawful assembly, conspiracy to riot, obstruction of free passage, interference with police, and a host of other minor charges. In late October, the court began hearing testimony from the policemen involved in making arrests. By all reliable accounts, spectators to the tennis protest had commenced jeering and taunting as the police made arrests. However, the police testimony presented an alternate version of reality, in which the protesters singing of My Country Tis of Thee became the socialist anthem Internationale. Because 
they sat down on the tennis courts instead of obeying police orders to leave, the demonstrators faced accusations of resisting arrest and failure to obey a policeman. The conspiracy to riot charges stemmed from the flyers distributed before the protest, because the flyers referred to staging a demonstration and made it clear that police would be involved. Attorneys for the defendants insisted the case was not just about the details of one protest at Druid Hill Park, but the larger history and continuing issue of segregation. In his argument, attorney I. Duke Avnet stated, No matter how much the state tries to hide it, the real issue is what are the rights of our people, and whether discrimination such as this is legal under the Constitution of the federal government and the state of Maryland. What is on trial here is persecution. What is involved are the rights of colored people. Judge Herman M. Moser agreed in part with the defendants. Because the segregation of parks was not a law passed by the city of Baltimore, he dropped the charges of violating a park rule. Even so, seven of those involved, all of whom were white, were convicted of unlawful assemblage and conspiracy to riot. The seven were fined, given suspended jail terms, and placed on probation for two years. Even though very little actually happened during the protest, Moser was unhappy with their actions. He stated, this was a carefully planned, competently executed conspiracy to violently disturb the peace. That it did not culminate in all the fury contemplated was not the fault of the conspirators, but due entirely to the good common sense of the police in handling the arrests. He also decided to suspend the prison terms of those convicted to avoid what he called a martyr-like exhibition of alleged wounds. The consequences of the protest, even for those who were not convicted of crimes, were sharply divided along racial lines. Most of the black participants lost their jobs because of their involvement, but none of the white participants were fired. Part of the reason the white participants faced fewer consequences was because many of them were college students, but that does not explain all of it. Several white and black demonstrators worked at a post office together. The white demonstrators kept their jobs, the black demonstrators were fired. Even after the trial made clear that segregation in Baltimore's public parks was policy and not a law, the tennis courts remained segregated. In 1950 and 1951, the Baltimore Tennis Club requested permission to hold the Baltimore Open Tennis Tournament in Druid Hill Park. Even though the club was black, tournament organizers were granted use of the white courts, but they had to guarantee that there would be no interracial play during the tournament. A compromise in regards to the tennis courts was finally reached on June 23, 1951. At that meeting of the Board of Recreation and Parks, President Anderson proposed a motion that separate tennis courts will be maintained for white and Negro patrons as in the past, but in addition, certain other courts will be designated on which interracial play will be permitted. While an imperfect solution, Anderson's proposal was a step in the right direction. The only black commissioner on the board, Dr. Bernard Harris, and the Baltimore Tennis Club both decided to support the proposal. In an appropriate twist of fate, the younger brother of one of the original demonstrators played in the first official integrated tennis match at Druid Hill Park. The tennis courts, along with all other public park facilities in Baltimore, were finally completely desegregated in 1955 in reaction to several Maryland court cases prompted by the Supreme Court decision of Brown v. Board. By that time, Dr. Harris had been replaced by another black man, Reverend Wilbur H. Waters. On November 18, 1955, Reverend Waters was given the honor of making the following motion. I move that the policy of this board be the operation of all park and recreational facilities under its jurisdiction be henceforward operated on an integrated basis. The motion carried unanimously. The new policy was announced to the public with the board of...